This is your flashcards for clinical application for module one. I'm going to recommend that at the start of each slide that you pause the recording and take notes and then restart the recording so that you can hear what I have to say so you don't have to write and listen at the exact same time. Here are your first quiz questions. Now you don't have to write down the quiz questions, although there is an area to write them if you should so choose, but ask yourself, can you answer these questions based on what you know as part of your flat flashcard. If you can't, you miss something a little bit, um, but it might not be a bad idea to write these down and kind of quiz yourself over and over again. Let's talk about chronic fatigue. Chronic fatigue is our first pathology flashcard that we're going to be working on. And know that just resting alone does not help chronic fatigue. So it seems like I'm tired, I should rest more, but that doesn't actually help. Uh, although it may worsen with activity during a flare-up. In general, we want to do lots of stuff for gentle, progressive exercise. In PTA 200, you're going to be talking about how to exercise. We want to make sure that when they do stretch or do they do do strengthening or endurance exercises, that they're utilizing the correct muscles at the correct time. So watching out for compensation, such as someone who's lifting something heavy might shrug their shoulders. That's a compensatory pattern, and we don't want them to do that because then they're going to end up causing pathology. We also want to make sure that we're monitoring their vital signs and we potentially can use what we call a visual analog scale uh, to determine how they're doing today. So there are actually fatigue scales out there uh, in general, but there's also you could use on a scale of 0 to 10. If 10 is I am about to fall asleep and 0 is no fatigue at all, how is your fatigue today? So there's a variety of um, of ability to kind of monitor that fatigue and maybe on a day where a patient is having a low level of fatigue, we could uh, maybe increase the amount of exercise or if they're having a high level of fatigue, maybe we would want to reduce the exercise. HIV. Uh, make sure that you know what indicates that HIV has become AIDS, and hopefully you are listing two things. We are going to be following our bloodborne and standard precautions with this. Ask yourself right now and pause the video so that you can answer what are the tenets of standard precautions. When you're following standard precautions, hopefully you've included hand washing, wearing appropriate personal protective equipment, coughing into your sleeve, wiping down the uh, surfaces. But the biggest and most important thing about standard precautions is the awareness that everyone is infected with something that we don't want to get. So we're going to assume even though that's a very nice person or they seem very clean or whatever, I don't care. We're going to assume they're infected and we don't want what they have and therefore we are going to take precautions to avoid catching it. Our patients with HIV are going to potentially present with pain syndromes. Uh, this means that we might have to work with them on managing their pain and reducing their pain, either through mindfulness strategies, meditations, or the use of something called modalities, which you'll see in PTA 202, something like heat or cold. Also, making sure that they exercise. Exercise improves both cardiovascular and pulmonary health, so reduces pathology there. It makes us feel good, which is a psychological benefit. And at a... Um, at a maximum of four, 14, sorry, oh my goodness, 14 uh, rate of perceived exertion. So RPE is rate of perceived exertion. And there's a whole scale that goes along with that that you will cover in PTA 200 at the maximum level. So that's a pretty high strenuous level. Uh, we would in general want to be a little bit lower because too strenuous is bad. But good amounts of exercise can boost our immune system. Lupus, with our patients who have lupus, again, progressive exercise. You're going to see this theme repeated over and over and over. These patients might also have skin issues, so they might be uh, something that we would want to counsel them with regards to uh, monitoring the skin and making sure that the skin integrity is good. These patients, because this is an autoimmune disease, so make sure that's in your notes, that lupus is an autoimmune disease. These patients might be on something that would reduce the amount of immune system activity, something like a corticosteroid. Corticosteroids are going to put this patient at risk for a couple issues. One of them is osteoporosis, and the other is that it's going to weaken the actual quality of their ligaments and tendons and make them at risk for injuries. So you kind of have to watch out when someone is on a corticosteroid. And again, an autoimmune disease like lupus, we might see that in their um, medical history, so watch out. 
Uh, scleroderma. Again, we're seeing that same corticosteroid issue. They're going to have itchy skin, and when people have itchy skin, they tend to scratch, and when they scratch, we tend to create wounds. And because the skin quality isn't really good with these patients, that wound might not heal well. So they may get physical therapy for wound healing. Uh, we also see that they might uh, need to have a stretching and a, a manual stretching. So you might stretch them and then you might give them exercises to keep stretching at home so that they maintain mobility. And our final one, hepatitis. Hepatitis, again, is following those standard precautions. Pause the video and rename those standard precautions. Our patients with hepatitis are also going to potentially have joint pain, so they might benefit from that heat or that cold or that modality. Also, mindfulness, meditation, deep breathing, all kinds of good stuff to help reduce their pain. That joint pain is probably going to be something that we would uh, strengthen and stretch and make sure that that joint is nice and stable. And then also, these patients are going to report fatigue. So uh, that chronic fatigue scale that we used or that uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, and we were talking about those fatigue scales, something could be very appropriate for this patient, including some education on maybe finding out what's important and using your energy for what's important in your life. If you don't like grocery shopping, let's order your groceries and use your energy for something else. If you love shopping, though, maybe you're going to conserve energy in your yard work by hiring someone. So talking with our patients and educating them about finding what's important to minimize the amount of fatigue. Okay, hopefully you got everything.